Praise the Lord, God's children, because this is a day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Welcome to the Master's Touch Sunday Worship Service. We're delighted to be able to bring these worship services to you to glorify God. You know, did you come expecting to receive from God today? Well, if you didn't come expecting to receive from God, then you won't. So raise that expectation level. Get it up there high. Now, as we begin our worship today, take a second and go assemble a small piece of bread or cracker and a swallow of some sort of beverage or juice. Set it aside. Later on, we'll pray over it, sanctifying it as the body and the blood of Christ. But let's begin right now by inviting the Holy Spirit to join us in our worship service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Savior. We enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts, open wide, expecting to receive your word and revelation knowledge. Our love and devotion for you is flowing freely from our lips, Lord. We love you, we magnify you, and we adore you. We praise your precious holy name. We thank and praise you that we believers dwell in the secret place of the Most High. We thank you that you've already heard our prayers. We rejoice because your word tells us that all of your prayers, and answers for our prayers, I mean, uh, um, are yes and amen for the believers. And we thank you for the gifts of utterance, the rhema word of God, and revelation knowledge. We thank you that the healing power of God is present to heal all who come to you in faith and in need. We give you thanks and praise for your only begotten Son and his finished work on the cross on our behalf. We thank you that we are totally healed, made whole, and completely restored, and we give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In the name above all names, the matchless name of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now we're going to be doing some worship this morning, and if you don't know these songs, then just listen to the words and let them minister to you as we worship and sing. Okay, let's get started. Body and spirit, all you 
you're doing, pull up a chair and get ready to receive because we've entered God's presence with praise and thanksgiving. And now as we dwell in God's presence, I want you to embrace the sweetness of the Holy Spirit. Bask in his presence. Open your hearts to receive him. Amen. Okay. <laughs>
Power for miracles, God's miracles, always follows the Word of God. And that's exactly where we're going next, deep into the Word of God. So, Father, let your words be my words, and my words be your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as I told you last week, these are very special messages from God, and therefore we're going to begin each of these lessons by going deeper into worship. Now, you may not appreciate this because we just spent time worshiping, but that's how it has to be, my friends. Remember me telling you that every time we meet, we follow a kind of set pattern, and we need to just flow with the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit wants us to worship Jesus continually until we arrive in His precious presence, and it's powerful there, and it's in its fullness. So let's just worship uh, and soak in worship right now. Now we're moving deeper into the subject of spiritual knowledge and today I'm going to be teaching on traveling in the spirit realm and we need to be able to sense the different heights of, of that our, our, our spirits are on we follow the Lord we follow uh, the Holy Spirit and so consequently um, uh, I want you to notice that when you when you worship God or sing to God, there's a lifting effect on your spirit. At times when we are thinking about other things, worldly things, there's a sinking feeling that we have, we go through, you know. Uh, and this is what I'm talking about. And we need to be able to sense it in our spirit in order to understand what we're going to talk about. All right. Last week we began talking about traveling through the spirit of the Lord. All right. And our text for that message was Acts 8, where we see Philip faithfully preaching the gospel wherever he went in Samaria. Now God sends him to preach the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch. He had successfully preached the gospel, and as a result, the eunuch made a decision for the Lord Jesus Christ. Philip was baptizing the eunuch in Acts 8, verses 38 through 40, and it tells us that when he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they had come out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught up Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Astos, and passing on, he preached the gospel to all the towns he came to until he came to Caesarea. 
So Philip was preaching the gospel, was suddenly caught up, and the Greek word for the words caught up comes from the, the, the word harpazo, which means to be snatched. So we know that it's very sudden, possibly at the speed of light and as fast as the twinkling of an eye, catching or snatching up. Now we're looking at traveling in the spirit, and we discovered that there is a form of physical traveling that's possible only in God. We know that Enoch walked with God and was not, and he was translated or transported up into heaven. It was the same with Elijah. There was a whirlwind, and there were horses of fire, and a chariot of fire, and he stepped up onto the, uh, onto it, and off he went up into the heavens above, and he saw, uh, he never saw physical death at all. So there are different forms of transportation in the spirit. In Acts 8, it's the spirit of God who caught up Philip and brought him up. In 2 Kings chapter 2, we're told that it was more or less a chariot, which God had sent to pick up Elijah. And <clears throat> there's also another form of traveling mentioned in the Bible, and it's in the book of Ezekiel, and this is by the hand of God. Now, as we see in Ezekiel 8, verses 1 through 3, So the hand of the Lord took him. That's the third form of transportation. We talked about there being a way that we can travel also by the devil, which I'm sure that we don't want to know about that, but we do need to know about that, don't we? <laughs> so, um, uh, knowing that, the devil ha it has an imitation of traveling in the spirit. Now remember, he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. In the book of Matthew, chapter 4, it was not the Holy Spirit who carried Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and on the mountain. It was the devil himself. Matthew 4, 5 says, Then the devil took him, so the devil carried Jesus. And some think that the temptation of Jesus Christ was played out only in his mind while he was physically in the wilderness. But... If that was so, my friends, there would be no actual temptation to throw himself down from the pinnacle of the temple. It was an actual tempt temptation telling him to throw himself down. It's possible that when Jesus was up there while the temptation was taking place that no one saw him, but he was actually physically there. It was the same way with Ezekiel. God has a way of covering one's eyes so that they're blinded to whatever God doesn't want them to see in that natural now in Luke 24, it talks about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. The Bible says that something was covering their eyes that prevented them from recognizing Jesus. If he had the power to prevent people from recognizing him, he had the power to prevent people from being able to see him on the pinnacle of the temple. That was a real temptation. How do I know that for sure? Well, because he was told to throw himself down, and if he had, it would have destroyed his physical body. It would have killed him physically. It was the devil that took him to the pinnacle of the temple, but Jesus had no fear at all. Matthew 4, 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. This time the devil took him to a mountain, didn't he? He was physically transported, and there's a satanic form of levitation that's I've been talking about to you, too. That's the imitation form, and it's accomplished by demons that specialize in that kind of trick. That kind of transporting would be a demonic manifestation. We have established that there are definitely several forms of spiritual travel, that there is a genuine spiritual manifestation, that, the, that ability to travel in the spirit, and there is a purpose. We have established that one can defy the law of gravity through the spirit world. Now remember, spiritual laws are higher than natural laws. Therefore, Jesus could defy the law of gravity. When Jesus was walking on the water, he was defying the law of gravity. We agree that it's possible, and the thing we want to know is how to reach that stage. In the examples in the Bible, we see that every one of those who were physically transported had some sort of relationship that was beyond the normal with God. They walked very deeply with God. Philip was in perfect obedience to God, and he was doing God's perfect will. So we ask the questions, is it possible to demand to be transported, to ask for it and expect it to manifest? Scriptures imply that it's not. If that were so, God would have constantly transported Philip by that method and everybody else. It's up to God to decide whether he wants to transport people in the spirit realm. And here's the reason. Transportation in the spirit is not a promise. Healing is a promise you can claim. Salvation is a promise you can claim. Walking on water or traveling in the spirit are not promises. So you can't claim it. It's only a recorded incident to show the possibility of it happening. But for it to happen, it has to be God's divine rhema and will for our life. Now, at the same time, if it is God's will, it won't just automatically take place either. There's a certain depth of relationship that these people had reached before they actually reached the realm of that possibility. In the spirit realm, those realm experiences become more possible when you have reached a specific depth of relationship with God. Only God knows that measure, by the way. So here's the emphasis. The depth of relationship and commitment to God. There must be a strength of yieldedness in the spirit before traveling and transportation in the spirit is possible. Two, it must come from the spirit of a man. We are spirit beings. We have a soul and we live in a body. It's our spirit that gives life to our physical body. And the spirit of a man sustains him. 
The spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord. The leading comes from the spirit of the man. The moment the spirit leaves our body, even though our body may be physically in perfect health, we still drop dead. It's our spirit that sustains our body. The fact is that our spirit not only can sustain our body, our spirit can also carry our body. We know that it's possible in the spirit realm, no matter what year or decade or dispensation we are in, to travel in the spirit. Now, the question is, can our spirit carry our physical body? The answer is yes. When the spirit of man reaches a certain spiritual level, the possibility is there, provided it's God's will. Now, at this point, we see that not only transportation in the physical realm can take place, but we see that even before the spirit begins to transport the physical body, if it's in accordance with God's will, the spirit of man is also able to travel by itself. That's what's known as traveling in the spirit realm. Now, transportation in the spirit realm then means physical transportation. Paul was acquainted with his traveling in the spirit or his spirit going to certain places. And it happens in dreams or in the subconscious state or when a person is slain in the spirit or is, is deep in the spirit in a trance-like state. Now, for some, it may even happen in their conscious state like it did for Philip. That's an experience that we want to talk about. So remember, in 2 Kings 5, the story of the Syrian general called Naaman. He was sent by the king of Syria to be healed of leprosy. He found out that there was a prophet called Elisha. And to make a long story short, he got healed in the end after dipping himself seven times in the Jordan River as he had been instructed. Now that was that, uh, now that he was healed, though, he was on his way back from there, and he offered money and all kinds of rewards to Elisha. Elisha said, no, thank you. But Gehazi, Elisha's servant, thought that his master was being stupid for not accepting the reward. So Gehazi ran after Naaman and he told a lie and said that some people had come and they were in need and Naaman gave him lots of gifts. Okay. Gehazi took the gifts and hid them. And then he came back and innocently acted like he, nothing had happened. And Elisha asked him, where have you been? 2 Kings 5, 25 through 26. He went in and stood before his master and Elisha said to him, where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, your servant went nowhere. But he said to him, Did I not go with you in spirit when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to receive money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep, oxen, and manservants and maidservants? And the judgment came on his life. Elisha said, Did not my heart go with you? All right, well, he's not talking about his physical heart, folks. He's talking about something deeper in him that could travel and move. Elisha saw everything. Elisha traveled in the realm where the spirit of man can travel, and Elisha was conscious the entire time. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote the Colossians epistle about the same time he wrote the book of Ephesians. And it was probably in Jerusalem at the time he was in jail. He went back to Jerusalem after the end of his third missionary journey. However, he hadn't gone to Rome yet. Now, here in Colossians 2, verse 5, we find him in the area of Jerusalem. Colossae was a great distance away. And note what he says. Though I'm absent in the flesh, I'm with you in spirit. He says, my spirit's been with you. And he went on to say, rejoicing to see your good order. So Paul's spirit knows what's happening there. He continues and, and it says, And in the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. He knew their condition, even though there was no physical way he had contacted them. His spirit could see. His spirit could travel. His spirit was with them. That's a powerful statement, my friends. Paul's acquainted with the spirit, uh, spirit, spiritual traveling. Wherever God wills, his spirit would go in his prayer life. He speaks like this again in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 3 and 4. For though absent in the body, I am present in the spirit. And if present, I have already pronounced judgment in the name of the Lord Jesus on the man who has done such a thing. When you are assembled, and my spirit is present. All right. Now, at this time, he was in Ephesus writing the book of Corinthians. He is telling them that when you are all together together to, to judge, I'll be there too. My spirit will be there with you. There are very few people that have reached that however, that, that stage. However, there is a level of that degree. And if we aren't aware that there is a level of that degree, we'll never try to reach that level, will we? No. We have discussed in the past the satanic form of spiritual travel called astral traveling. This is a type of soul travel with a spiritually dead spirit. Now, it's commonly practiced by students of the occult. We Christians recognize that everything we have from the supernatural, the devil imitates. The devil can't create. The Apostle Paul said he traveled in the spirit in places. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 3. And here's what it says. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. So here he was, so deep in the spirit that he was taken into heaven. And he was not sure whether he was taken physically or he was taken spiritually. Now, Paul went to Colossae and to Corinth spiritually. In the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 2, it says, At once I was in the spirit, and lo, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. 
Here, it's very clear that he was in the spirit. His physical body was still on the island of Patmos in prison. So, we ask, are there laws that will work in this realm? And what are they like? Ephesians 2 tells us that we are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Although our spirit is in the innermost part of our being, it's capable of ascending to the heights of the heavenly places while leaving our physical body down here. It's almost impossible to understand this in the natural. Now, I've been in many places in the spirit, and I spend time with God and meditate on God's word, and I have absolutely no fear. At first, it was a little eerie, but God, did, it, God is with you, and you're completely comfortable, and it's exciting. Now, as my spirit traveled, my conscious mind was with my spirit, and I felt everything, and I was conscious of uh, everything. So, there have been many times since my first experience that I've been caught up in the spirit, and God has shown me things. There are a few things that happen while traveling in the spirit. Number one, you can be on a different planes, different levels in the spirit. And this means your spirit can go to the lowest plane in hell or it can go to the highest plane in the third heaven. Number two, you can be in different places geographically. Number three, you don't, have, you don't travel in the spirit at the speed of light. You travel in the spirit at the speed of thought. Thought is faster than the speed of light and the physical body is not able to travel at a greater degree of speed than the speed of light. However, the spirit and soul man, which are connected, are able to break that barrier and travel. Number four, you travel through time zones. Your spirit has the peculiar quality of being able to pass through time zones. So as you're caught up in the spirit, you may be brought into the past and even given a visualization of something that was taking place then. And why would we be sent back into the past? To, to, well, well, to give you a clarification of something that took place then. But no one got it, so God sends you to fulfill that reason. So we've established that we can travel in the spirit to the future or to the past. Now, we know. What traveling in the spirit without the body is like. And we can go forward to gain understanding of what traveling in the spirit with the body is like. It's the spirit that lifts up your body, and the closest experiential side of it is that our spirit is able to sense which level we are on. We may experience a heaviness in our spirit, and when your spirit's heavy, it's because the things in the natural, the physical realm, are pressing in and weighing your spirit down. Your spirit can actually be imprisoned by your soul. Your spirit can be imprisoned to your physical body. Those, are, uh, those who are dead in the spirit don't feel anything. But when you have become spiritually conscious or alive, you begin to sense being closed in, and it's a kind of claustrophobic spirituality. You're unable to reach great heights in the spirit when this heaviness happens. Now, you may feel like you're imprisoned by the carnal nature of your physical body, and it's then that you'll find it's easier to yield to that fleshly area than to the higher things of the spirit. The Bible has a word for it. In Isaiah 61, verse 3, it says, To grant those who mourn in Zion to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. Now, some Bibles record it as a spirit of heaviness. What kind of heaviness are we talking about here? It's talking about something in the spirit that's putting pressure on your spirit being. That's a spirit of heaviness. Physical heaviness is like a drag on your body. You feel it physically. The soul begins to weigh in and create a heaviness that shows up physically. The Hebrew word uh, heaviness is the word kehar, which actually means weakness. It's a spirit of weakness. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So, what happens if the spirit's weak and the flesh is weak? Then you're finished. Kaput. There's a tip, type of spiritual weakness that prevents person, a person from ascending up. Not in the rapture. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about spiritual traveling. Then in Proverbs 12, 25, it says, Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Now remember how important the word heart is. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Elisha said, I'm sorry, 2 Kings chapter 5, Elisha said to Gehazi, My heart went, at, went with you. Okay, now what I'm doing is trying to describe what our spirit man experiences when it reaches that point where it is capable of traveling. I want you to understand what it experiences. There are times when the spirit man is incapable of traveling. For example, when your car is idling, the engine is on and it's ready to engage. When you drive up to a traffic light and it turns red, you don't shut off your car, put on the emergency brake, and sit there waiting for it to turn green. You keep your car engine engaged. If the car is not moving forward, you don't have to put your emergency brake on. Your foot's on the brake pedal waiting for the light to turn green. You're in the position of readiness to go. But if you've turned off the engine, put on your emergency brake, and then waited for the traffic light to turn green, you'll be in the midst of a lot of blowing horns aimed at you. There's no way that you can hurriedly insert the key, turn on the ignition, undo the emergency brake, and engage the engine, step on the gas, and go with any degree of swiftness. So you may not go anywhere. You may have to sit through the green light again and find yourself in the red light once more. And 
to top it all off, you may find yourself in sin because you are in the red light district. <laughs> That's a little joke. Okay, moving on. The time that our spirit man is not ready is when the spirit's heavy. So the engine is off and the brake is on for traveling. You have to find a way of engaging and keeping the spirit man in that state of readiness. Beware of heaviness. There are two forms of heaviness. One form of heaviness comes out of a spirit of weakness, as we see in Isaiah 61. And the other is found in Proverbs 12, verse 25. Just have a second. The word anxiety in the scripture in, in the old King James has been translated as heaviness. Heaviness in the heart. If Elisha's heart was heavy, he wouldn't have been able to see Gehazi. So we have established that there has to be a form of spiritual buoyancy to be able to re remain in the position to travel. Now the Hebrew word for anxiety or heaviness here is diara. It means sorrow or worry. These things pull you down. And we know why Jesus says not to worry, because when you worry, you can't see the things of the Spirit any longer. Your spiritual eyes become blind. So Jesus says don't worry. Now, when you worry for your food, clothing, and shelter, it worsens your situations. You need to be able to see ahead to know where your provision comes from. When you worry, you actually set yourself back doubly. So, what we have, uh, have discovered so far is what? The heart of a man can be pressed down. Heaviness of the second type is caused by anxiety, worry, and sorrow. The opposite of heaviness of heart is gladness of heart. It's a lightness of heart, a buoyancy. And when the heart feels light, it's easier to perceive and be ready to go forth in the spirit. We have to guard ourselves against these two forms of heaviness, friends. If when you pray you begin to be weighed down, you won't be able to pray through. So these are the two thou shalt not. The two things we must not allow to come into our spirits. Let's briefly talk about grief. Grief is also a form of the second type of heaviness, and it creeps up on you. This kind of heaviness leaves you wondering whether your faith is, where your faith is actually. Uh, because we, when you need it, oh, excuse me, when you need it, you couldn't find it, you know. Why? Because your spirit's been pressed down. Faith can only exist when your spirit's free to fellowship with God, friends. So many times, people's power lines go to God have been cut. What happens if there's too many power failures in a town? The businesses can't do anything. Likewise, people can't do much in the spirit because their spirits keep getting cut off from God. You're not, you know, you're still saved. I'm not saying you're not saved. You're still saved, but you lose your fellowship. You don't lose your your relationship, but you do lose fellowship. And why don't you why do, don't you lose your relationship? Well, because the spirit of God dwells in you. But somehow something has muddled up that free link that you have with God. How can we keep our spirits high and free in God? Revelation 1:10 tells us this. It was in the spirit on, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Okay, notice the phrase I was in the spirit. We have to learn how to be in the spirit. Point one, learn how to be in the spirit. We have to do some things in the natural, our daily duties and responsibilities. However, there are some things that you can do in the flesh while um, in the spirit. You can drive your car, and then while you're driving, you can set your mind and spirit on autopilot and pray in tongues. That's how you remain in the spirit while driving the car. Now, there's some natural tasks that are impossible to do while in the spirit, and when your mind is con concentrating on something, your focus is on the item you're concentrating on. It's then that you'll find it's a bit more difficult to be in the spirit while doing these kinds of things. So what you do, well, what do you do? You just cover yourself in a prayer and say, Lord, help me in all those areas. I have to, to finish my responsibilities after all. And after you've finished all the things in the natural, then give thanks to God. And that's the most that you can do. During the time you're uh, doing those everyday duties, you're in the natural. So you'll be dealing with your flesh. So let's say you can't even pray in tongues because you're using your mouth for things that pertain to your work. You have to be in the natural to finish the responsibilities dictated by your job. So cover yourself before you enter that area by thanking God for help in those areas. So you can't be in both the natural and the spirit at the same time. So we must learn to be in the spirit. Part of it involves Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.18-19. through 19. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. Notice that he says making melody in your heart. You experience a lightness like a floaty feeling in your innermost being. It's then that your spirit has ascended on high, and in that position it would be easy to move into any place that God wants you. Point number two, you can only go where the Holy Spirit wants you to go. In other words, while you're in the Spirit, your Spirit rides on the Holy Spirit. And it's not like the demonic uh, realm of the occultist travel, where they try to will themselves into that traveling realm. Although you, your will 
will be intact, you'll be conscious of it. But that's not that's only possible when the Lord allows it, friends. So don't sit and try to concentrate on your spirit going somewhere. You may open yourself up to a demonic power, and it may not be the Holy Spirit that comes to carry you. Now, point number two is important. It can only happen when, when it's God's will. Okay. I've said a lot. It can only happen when it's God's will. Let God be the mover and let him take you where he wants you to go. And if he doesn't take you anywhere, at least there's one place you can always be, the heavenly place. Don't think in your heart, I am going to concentrate on traveling to the Garden of Eden. God will not permit you to. And if you do that, the devil may take you into a different garden altogether. Revelation 4, 1 and 2 says, After this I looked, and lo, in heaven an open door. Oh, now he's about to travel. He's already in the Spirit, and he had a vision in the Spirit, and this is what happens. And the first voice which I heard, speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up hither, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit. You can see that it took God's command, come up here or go there or go through the time zone to enable spiritual traveling. So allow your spirit to be led by the spirit. Don't try to lead the Holy Spirit. No, the Holy Spirit is holding you. You don't know as much as he does. He knows your purpose. And that's why point number two is important. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us. Point number three is suddenness. Notice in Revelation 4 verse 2 that it says, Immediately I was in the spirit. Now, the same with Acts 8. Philip was snatched, and there was a suddenness to that happening. Same with uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, and suddenly there were horses of fire and chariots of fire before them. There will be quickness, swiftness, and a suddenness when traveling takes place in the spirit world. When God caught Ezekiel by the hair and took him, it, uh, it took place suddenly. In other words, it's not a reward for something. It's not because you fasted 40 days and 40 nights. It's not because of anything that you have done, although there is the point of having your engine continually ready and engaged. Yet when it actually occurs, it will just happen. Now, I know people who have had half experiences. Half experiences mean you're about to enter the spirit realm and you feel yourself being taken up. But because of fear and anxiety in your heart, you are dropped down like a hot rock. <laughs> okay. Now, when you try to get there again, you can't. Your mind's trying to have an experience, but there's no relationship with God. But if you all, but if all you, if all you will be concerned with is is God, if all that you'll be concerned with is God, and His presence, when it happens, it'll be sudden. The suddenness at any time, any place, is for when He chooses. The fact that the opposite uh, Apostle Paul uh, seems to have some control over it brings us to the fourth point. Number four, you receive ability to know some things by your spirit movement. Like Paul saying, when my spirit will be with you, uh, Colossians 2, verse 5, and Colossians 5, I mean 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry. Let me give this again. Colossians 2, chapter 2, verse 5, and 1 Corinthians 5, chapter 5. As you develop spiritually, you move into the realm where God gives you liberty, and that's not accessible by you normally. In points 1, 2, and 3, you can't get it. You receive ability to know some things by your spirit movement. And it looks as if Paul's initiating the thing, but it's sort of like when you were 9 years old and you didn't have a driver's license, you know. So anywhere you wanted to go, someone had to take you. But as you grow, you take your driver's test, and when you've passed the test, you're given a license to drive. Now, if your license is a local license, you can't drive in a foreign country. You have to apply for an inter international license, and then legally you'll be able to drive while in Europe, overseas. So, like that, there is this depth you enter into where God allows you limitations within your sphere of moving about, in the spirit realm. It's evident that many intercessors are given that gift, and many of those who grow deep in God enter into that realm. Now, I've experienced while praying for a person that I actually find myself visiting that person's home in the spirit. I am convinced that Colossians 2.5 was taking place while Paul was praying for the Col Colossians that his spirit must have gone to visit them, and he was seeing them as they are. So we need to open our hearts and our minds to receive God's direction in our lives. When it comes to spiritual traveling without uh, our fleshy nature, trying to force our will upon our spirit man, which ha hampers our ability to spiritually move with the Holy Spirit, by the way. Like anything else that's a gift from God, we must not take it for granted, nor must we be greedy and rush God. We simply have to be open to this realm of the Spirit of God and wait on Him. When we do, then we experience the realm of suddenly. And, um, I don't know what that is. Let me get rid of that. Oh, dear me. Um, uh, we'll find ourselves in other lands, and we won't know how we travel there. All right? I hope you received that. Um, 
I want you to get it, but right now I'm just going to give you some music to think about. Right now, if you desire to come into and dwell in the miraculous presence of Jesus our Lord and Savior, if you desire to be in Christ and avail yourself of his marvelous wisdom, you must give your life to him. It's very simple and it's pain free. Just repeat this prayer. Lord Jesus, I come to you as a sinner and surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me and set me free for all eternity from all my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead and sit at the right hand of God the Father. Take over my life and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I renounce the devil and all sin. Lord, I receive from you the gift of righteousness, total forgiveness of all my sins, past, present, and future divine wholeness and health and restoration, your protection, direction, your provision, your peace, and the gift of everlasting life. I'm yours. Come into my heart. Take over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, then you're saved. Welcome to the family of God and rejoice. One of the wonderful things that we receive from taking Holy Communion is healing of our bodies and minds. The issue with those who take Holy Communion and don't receive their healing through it is rooted in lack of knowledge. We must prepare before taking Holy Communion and the first thing that we must do is discern the body of Christ. What does that mean? How do we do that? By acknowledging that the bread or whatever you're using as the body of Christ is the vibrancy of the life of Jesus, his supernatural healing and wholeness. And you can think of it as a pill that's glowing with the Shekinah glory of God. It's healing you as it travels through your mouth and down into your body. And it's pushing all darkness, which is sickness and disease, out from the inside out. Now visualize the condition you're plagued with, the disease or sickness being on Jesus' body. Then put whatever the ailments are on him and use your imagination. You're not giving him something he doesn't want. He already took it at the cross. You see, the enemy's trying to trick you. He's trying to trick you into taking it. How? By deceiving you into thinking that you've got it. But since Jesus took it already at the cross, you are healed and made whole already. So put it back on Jesus right in the same place on him that you've been afflicted. In other words, see yourself with a solution without the problem. And this is called spiritual visualization. It's vital you understand it and do it.
The next thing we do is in preparation is discern the blood of Christ. We discern it as the forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future. As restoration of the blessing to our life, the power and the authority of God in your life in full operation. As receiving the gift of righteousness from God uh, through Jesus Christ, thanking God for his plan of redemption, that you have been given eternal life, life everlasting, and now you no longer live under the law, but you live under his grace. Now, assemble those... Uh, elements of the covenant that I asked you to get at the beginning of the program and lift them up before the Lord as I pray. Father, we praise you and worship you with these elements of the covenant. We thank you that your only begotten son, Jesus, gave his life sacrificially so that we may live and have life more abundantly. We thank you now as this bread becomes our portion of his healing body and the vibrancy of his life within us. We thank you that as we partake of the body of Christ, we become healed and made whole, completely restored. We thank you that this beverage becomes our portion of his cleansing blood, that we are continually washed in his blood and renewed within as we perpetually remember his act of love on the cross on our behalf. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, amen. The Lord's Supper is a personal fellowship. It's actually a partnership with Christ, and partaking of one bread creates partnership between the members as well, and it merges us all together into one body, the church. Now, the Word of God commands us to eat the bread and drink the cup. Do this. Perform this action. Continually take the bread, give thanks, and break it, and eat it in remembrance of Jesus. Then take the cup and do the same thing. Now, the Lord commanded that the supper be repeated often. However, in the verse, Paul doesn't really give us instruction as to how frequently the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated. So, he does imply, though, that it's to be done frequently so that partaking of the Lord's Supper perpetually recalls to our mind our redemption by Christ from all sickness and disease and all sin. So do it as often as you want to and need to. As we are instructed, we discern the body and the blood of Christ as we prepare to partake. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus, broken for you, so that you are and remain healed, made whole, and totally restored. In, name, in the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. Partake of the body of our Lord and Savior. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of our Lord Jesus shed for you for the remission of sins. In the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. Partake of the blood of our Lord and Savior. Now, Raise your hands for the blessing. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. May you uh, walk in the health, uh, full of divine health and wholeness, full of the vibrancy of life, able to do miracles, full of confidence in God and his word and in himself and yourself and, and what you're able to do to accomplish for God. Because as Jesus is, so are you in this world. Hallelujah, my friends. May the Lord bless you with that because that belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Mm -hmm.